Well, with that opening, you know, let me go ahead and record the meeting and we'll let, uh, we'll call our foundation meeting to order here for uh, for September. Welcome all, you know, on this rainy day. And it, uh, as Mike and I were talking about, we're, we're very we're welcoming of this, uh, of everything that's going to happen here. So we've got a full day today. We're going to be talking at, um, obviously, we'll go through the OSU um, gardening to do's, number of announcements coming up. Um, we're going to be talking about our elections for the officers for 2024, because this is October. This is when we get after that. And then Doug Collins is going to be joining us. Doug Collins is with WSU Pulley Up, and he is the he is the he's the head soils guy at WSU Extension these days. And it um, since uh, Craig Cogger uh, retired, and so it's a, it's really going to be great to have um have him come. And I specifically wanted him to talk about soil amendments, because uh, it, um, it um, in terms of it, um, biosolids and so forth. So it, uh, we'll get to that. So jumping in, right, October, you know, is a busy month. You know, we celebrated Indigenous Peoples Day yesterday. Um, uh, uh, lots of birthdays. I'm thinking about Helen's birthday um, coming up this next weekend. We'll be sure to send you a card, Helen. That's for sure. You know, 39 forever. It's going to be great. And it, uh, boy, and it uh, uh, Terry, Nancy, Dolores, Beth Day, Water, Cindy, and Hugh. So, uh, and a shout out also for next Monday's study group, uh, Midge can't join, so uh, Jude and I will be hosting the study group, and we have an individual coming from a uh, community college in uh, near Everett talking about habitat restoration and particular issues they've dealt with in invasive species control, including common invasive species and uh, techniques for habitat restoration in a controlled environment. So welcome, everybody, our October to-dos. You know, this is when at uh, OSU is specifically talking about, um, you know, at um, uh, getting after your cover crops. Um, and it was interesting um, at the state conference um, week before last, at which several of us were there, there was quite an emphasis from many of the speakers saying, don't give up on cover crops, you know, really, really pushing us to push hard on cover crops and give them a go in terms of, uh, you know, and if, if one uh, species isn't working for you, mix something else in, you know, go for some fava beans, you know, just do a mix up and to figure out what's right for you. But um, never garden naked, right, is it uh, is how they would uh, is how they would phrase it. Um, time to propagate. And again, this is a great time to be thinking ahead to um, uh, uh, to next summer's plant sale. If you want to be thinking about what can you be digging up and dividing and propagating now that might be useful uh, to be uh, to put it forward to our plant sale next July. So at uh, lots of opportunities to be at uh, uh, to be pushing up and making things happen. Um, you obviously at um, anybody want to talk about the, uh, the the seed saver event you had at um, at uh, at the Elma Garden uh, recently, it's Val. Yeah. It's not until uh, uh, the end of the month, October 29th. Oh, it's we're, coming up. Okay. We're still in preparation. Yeah. Oh, so the pic that's right, because the pictures were from last year's. Okay. Right. The pictures in the E News were from last year's. Yeah. So, at, um, but there's a great opportunity here to save the seeds. And this is then obviously OSU is really pushing on this too. This was another point, by the way, that was made at several of the, um, at several of the sessions at the state conference in that as we have gotten good at developing hybrid vegetables and other hybrid plants, we have optimized for yield and we have lost nutrient value. So most of the hybrid seeds that are now being pushed out for vet major vegetable crops, major uh, grain and vegetable crops, are gaining higher yield, more resistant to pest and such, but they are lower in nutrients than the heirloom varieties of years past. So there's a strong encouragement to think about the varietals that you are putting into your gardens and think about the nutrient value that uh, you want to uh, dig out. Okay, pest monitoring. Obviously, uh, lots of stuff going on here, and this is, of course, uh, very much reminders that um, uh, it's so important to uh, to understand the type of pest that is afflicting um, our plants before we prescribe a treatment. Um, a number of us were at the Dahlia <coughs> Festival here in Owaco, and we had a plant clinic there. Uh, by the way, a very successful plant clinic. I mean, when's the last time you had 60 plus people show up at your plant clinic, you know, but, uh, you know, for that... Uh, but it was very specific when you got 60 plus people asking about Dahlia problems, you know, you've really got to get, you've really got to take the pencil out, right? And do some deep diving in terms of what could be going wrong. 
And yes, there's a lot of stuff that goes wrong with Dolly, as we've learned. And a shout out to Bev, by the way, for tremendous amount of research in preparation for that plant clinic to dig up information about dahlias and at uh, Dahlia Pest. So lesson learned, right? Make sure you really understand what you're talking about and the plant and the soil and the conditions before you prescribe a problem. <clears throat> okay. Um, interesting, by the way, I like, uh, uh, Mike, you were talking about controlling moles down your road. And uh, you, re you, see the, you see the OSU uh, bullet down there saying, hey, if moles and gophers are a problem, consider traps. Well, traps are illegal here in Washington State, right? You know? <clears throat> but Mike, I, I presume you kind of overlooked that, that you nuanced that little understanding up your private lane there? <laughs> yeah, I have. It's, it's not illegal for stores to sell them, but it's illegal for you to to trap with them that the lesser of the two evils is I'm I'm pretty good at, at catching the little buggers. I've got some tricks up my sleeve and persistence and modifying the traps. But uh, if anybody needs any tips or pointers, I can certainly uh, set them up for success. So be careful, Mike, right? This re this meeting's being recorded and it'll be posted on YouTube, right? So <laughs> that, uh, so DNR will be coming after you, right? You know, is it... Uh... <laughs> Not to worry, <laughs> not to worry. Okay, composting, right? Composting is out to, to, you know, in winter prep, it's time to be thinking about these things, obviously. Um, you know, cleaning, sharpening, and oil too. This is something I I've, I have it bolded here because it's something I never get around to doing as well as I need to be doing. Um, and these, you know, think about all that, think about everything from your shovels to your, at, um, your garden shears, um, to your pruning tools, right? You know, there's such an opportunity uh, to keep these things sharp and at, uh, in shape. Okay. And then on to, um, our officers and on to considerations of, it, um, of, it, um, of our, of our operations here. So as we, in our last, we're into our last, uh, three months here of 2023 and your 2023 elected board is here. And it, um, they indeed are, you know, are, you know, winding up their, um, their route you know, their route. Um, we also have, whoops, what happened there? Okay. That didn't go well. Let me go try this again here. And it, uh, go back to where it was at here. And so, yes. So we should be, I'm sharing the PowerPoint, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Should be sharing the PowerPoint slideshow right now. Here we go. Okay. So yeah, so reminder of um, uh, reminder that Tony is our liaison. Um, an announcement from Tony, I think, is what uh, we're all we're all aware now is that she is retiring at the end of this calendar year. So at uh, so she will not be our our faculty liaison at the end of this year. She is going through a series of tours, right? A series of uh, coffee shop tours around the uh, around the the opportunity the um, the uh, around the the two counties. Um, the schedule is posted in um, the e-news, um, and I encourage everyone to, uh, to sit down and have a chat with her. She'll talk about the fut her future. She'll talk about you know the future in terms of transitioning, um, what we're doing here, uh, you know, is it um, uh, and it uh, and where and, and where things need to go next. So um, there's an opportunity then to um, to have a chance to, to <laughs> chat with her and to ensure that uh, everybody's understanding what's going on. Um, Alina and Brenda, of course, are fact, are our uh, coordinators, and it um, uh, we make the point here is that uh, these coordinators are also master gardeners. You know, Brenda and Alina, and we are one of only two counties that actually have none WSU um, coordinators, and it's uh, one of only two counties that fund their coordinators. You know, into such a to such a degree. So it, we truly are unique in that fashion. And a shout out to both Alina and Brenda for the work that they do, because we have to have a liaison faculty, and we have to have the coordinators in order to have the program. So time to talk about elections, you know, and it, uh, the good news is this elections will not be anywhere near as fractious or as polarizing, right, as what we're experiencing, you know, and everything from our school boards to, at, uh, to our state uh, cycles and our certainly our federal elections. So our bylaws, by our bylaws, October is the month at which we elect our, our officers. And so at, uh, this usually we accomplish this, if you recall, back in Cosmopolis, it used to be a very easy up and down vote, right? You know, and it, um, and we, we took care of it in a few seconds. 
literally, you know, at uh, at Cosmopolis. Um, it won't be the it's, it's since COVID, it's not been the case. And what we'll be doing is that I'll be sending out a ballot with all candidates on it to all members, and it uh, and inviting them to either vote for all uh, candidates on the ballot or to write in whoever name you want to go go with, and it um, and send it back. And it, we've been doing that since COVID, and it's uh, it's worked uh, quite successfully. And I, um, I assure you, ballot tampering has not been an issue, and nor is stuffing the ballot box and so forth. So it, uh, it's just a, uh, it, uh, we've uh, we've had a very successful at um, a very successful election process uh, using using the email this this email system. So what we have to do in this month is elect all the officers in red. So a president, president-elect, a VP, a secretary, treasurer, our state reps, program support, and public events directors. And then the directors for Coastal Grays Harbor, Greater Grays Harbor, and Pacific County, those directorships are voted on and selected from those communities. So uh, those names will not be appearing on the ballot that I'll be pushing out. We will leave it up to each area, right? to conduct their own elections and their own their own you know their own processes um these are coveted positions and i know that um you know i know that um, so sheila jan and val speak about how uh, how intensely the, the 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 competition is right for these for these roles and it uh it's uh, it's whoever doesn't step back fast enough right you know it um, usually ends up in that <laughs> in that role so the candidates that uh, that Elizabeth and her nominating committee have worked to prepare for us are listed here on this slide. So Elizabeth, you know, will be nominated for president. Mike Carvia has stepped forward, a president-elect position. Uh, I'm willing to run again as a VP. Lori is willing to continue on as secretary. Sharon is continuing as a treasurer. And Karen, Aaron, and Sharon, you know, continuing as our state reps. Lori continuing our program support and Terry, Robin and Rhonda, you know, continuing in our public events. So you're, you're very much, all, these will appear on the ballot that I'll be pushing out to everyone. Everyone is of course, uh, you're, you're, you're free to vote for whomever you want on, and it uh, doesn't have to be these names here. Uh, but these are the individuals that have stepped forward, willing to continue in their roles or willing to take on the responsibilities of these positions. By the way, job, roles and job descriptions are posted on the website so it uh so if there's any question about what these folks do right you know at uh um uh it's, it, it's available uh for for reference any questions so far by the way regarding the ballot or regarding the process and how this thing plays out very good so this will happen then and it, um, you know, expect that to come out here. I'll, you know, I just wanted to, I wanted to have today's meeting, but I'll, I'll push it out um, here in the next, um, in the next day or so. And so, so the ballot will be coming out like this. Um, you either can uh, fill it out and send it back or just send back, you know, Hey, I vote for all candidates. Right. And it, um, and we'll be done with it. Okay. Okay. Time for announcements, opening it up to folks. What have we got to share? Alina and Brenda, I know you have some things to talk about. Uh, sure, this is Elena. Um, you've already mentioned the road trip uh, lo locations, Aberdeen on Friday, October 20th, and Ocean Shores on Saturday, October 21st. Uh, we had one in Iwako this last week, and it was very we got a lot of things talked about, and so I've been encouraging everyone, Brenda and I are, to to sign up for or to come to one of the remaining four road trip locations. And again, it's in the evenings. Um, a little bit more about our training. Uh, we now have speakers for many of the classes, um, almost all of them, in fact, from WSU and from OSU. And so that's going to provide more information than what is in the handbook on some of these topics. So we're excited about that. We already have trainees who, people who've applied for the training and have passed the background check. So now we're in constant 
uh, contact with them. We already have mentors, volunteers, and so we'll be contacting all of you for interested interest in mentoring for the next year. Um, it's just, it's really coming along well and we're excited about it. We're going to have up to four locations and two at Grace Harbor and two in uh, Pacific County, if it works out that way. And I've already had one person who's been accepted past the background check asking me, you know, I'm really glad that I don't have to travel so far. Um, are there any locations? Because we are going to be meeting together and as a whole group uh, four, three or four times, I'm not sure which. Um, and she wanted to know, you know, how could she could travel. And so I'm going to be talking to her about carpooling and, and other things like that. So I think it's going to be very well received this coming year. Um, I know Brenda wanted to say something about, um, let me see. He's posted in the chat that he's having some trouble with her audio, but she notes that recertifications are beginning this week. Recertifications for next year, the upcoming year. And she is exhorting us, exhorting us, great word in Scrabble, right? You know, because it uses X to uh, get those impacts entered as soon as you can. So if you've been tardy and procrastinating, you know, this is the time to get those uh, those impacts entered, please. Anything else for Alina? How many folks have we got signed up uh, to uh, candidates to train for next year? Nope. May have lost her. <laughs> okay. No worries. Very good. Okay. So at uh, other announcements. Oh. Brenda, Brenda put in chat five so far. Okay. So other announcements. Um, um, Aaron, um, Karen, Sharon, any comments on the state conference? Just, uh, just, um, just held. Well, um, it was great. I had some great classes. The hotel was awesome. The food was awesome. Um, and it's probably the last one we'll have. They're talking about never doing it again. Next year, it'll be virtual. And the following year is kind of up in the air. It's very expensive to put on and um, not a lot of people, not as many as they would hope for came. So, the, so again, to be clear, right, the conference will continue, right, but not in a face-to-face -face conference. It'll be virtual going forward. It, next certainly, year, certainly it's next, gonna, year. next year, it's going to be virtual, and 2025 is up in the air about how that will happen. That's something we'll be discussing at the state level. Okay. Erin, any comments yourself? Um, I was just going to kind of add to what Karen said. Um, we, the state foundation did um, operate, the, we lost six to $8,000 on the conference, which was actually significantly better than expected. So um, yeah, so there, like Karen said, 2024 will be virtual. Beyond that, they're looking at other ways to get together, maybe, you know, because there are so many educational opportunities now, we don't necessarily need the education portion of it. Um, but it would be nice to have some sort of a gathering at a state level. Um, so they're just exploring and other options and looking for some out of the box kind of ideas that we can do going forward, that will be more cost effective and um, hopefully a lower cost for attendees as well. I have to admit though, is that the, um, um, just to, to make sure that everybody knows that, um, that uh, the thing that we're gonna miss most of course is the silent auction and the raffle. Um, and a shout out to Lori Biddle, because uh, uh, Lori was able to secure, uh, she won four raffle items. So I encourage wow. you, if, if you want to have uh, Lori pick up your, 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 your lottery tickets, right. You know, I'd strongly <laughs> encourage, right. You know, to go in a share. 
Um, we actually had to uh, secure a, a, a whole a luggage cart to get all of her winnings uh, out. At, uh, quite a Wow. Quite, yeah. What did you get, Lori? Um, I got, well, one was a nice Japanese pruner, so long handle. That's cool. Um, okay. And a piece of artwork, a print, and um, a basket of honey items and bee items. And um, oh, a puzzle, one puzzle. <laughs> I don't gamble either, so this is something. <laughs> <laughs> no, so to be clear, I'm I'm sending up money so Lori can buy some lottery tickets for me. So that's yeah. for sure. It's just obviously working well. Yeah. Hey, so uh, uh, any other announcements regarding the state conference? Then, so it uh, sounds like stay tuned for what's going to happen in the future. You know, it um it uh, it was it um, it what it was from an education standpoint. I took I took away a lot. I I valued the sessions and the learning. You know, as always. Hey, uh, Brenda, Shar has a question uh, regarding recertification. Specifically, right, do we have to have our hours into uh, completed by the end of this month or by the end of the year for recertification? I mean, either can, you know, post a response. We have to, okay, year end. <clears throat> we have all year. So we still got, uh, you know, two and a half months to, to go here to get it all done. So Shar, you can wipe the sweat off your brow. You know, you have time to get it all done. Okay, other announcements. Other announcements. Okay, so again, encouragement to go back to the e-news, a lot of other announcements and other things talking about there. Reminder then that uh, this year, for this year, right, you know, our meetings uh, have been on at, um, uh, what we've done is that uh, has been virtual meetings on the first two months of the quarter. And then we've gone to a Saturday meeting on the third month of the quarter. And so the shout out I want to have right now, right, is that um, is that uh, we will, of course, we'll have our virtual meeting coming up on November 14th. That'll be the next month's meeting. And then on Saturday, December 2nd, we'll actually be talking tonight, by the way, we will talk tonight at our board meeting regarding uh, what we want to do regarding a foundation meeting in December. But I want to do a shout out right now for December 2nd, Saturday, December 2nd will be a recognition event. And at uh, that, um, um, Alina, Brenda, I don't know if you want to have any postings or any comments uh, today regarding that. Uh, we expect that to be at the Aberdeen Log Pavilion and it, uh, it'll be a potluck. And it'll be an important recognition because we'll have the, the graduation awards for our 2022 class. So make sure that December 2nd is on our calendars. Regarding board meetings, right? We are board meetings continue to be held at 6 p.m. on the second Tuesday, 6 p.m. on the second Tuesday. And so there will be a board meeting tonight at 6 p.m. Everyone is welcome to join. Um, you know, and it, uh, and part of this, uh, the full agenda tonight, um, uh, will include discussion about, you know, our December meeting, we'll be talking about when we want to get together for a strategic planning meeting, uh, a strategic planning meeting in which we can determine our budget, uh, for next year and at, uh, program plans and program priorities for next year. So all are welcome to join in that. Okay. Any questions regarding meetings or <clears throat> your activities? Very good. So this is, again, that uh, I always put this slide up again in terms of recording the hours. Um, uh, um, uh, you know, any questions regarding uh, give, uh, give Pulse, you know, reach out to either Brenda or to Alina. Um, Alina, I think you've been fairly successful, right, in having people at, um, uh, 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 sign up and, at, um, and use and get those hours in, correct? Correct. Yes. And, and the couple of people that have called and needed help, I have forwarded the message to Brenda because she's much more savvy now at handling these random problems than I am. I'm pretty much, you know, this is the way you do it. But if you have problems, uh, talk to Brenda. And because Brenda is, I was, I got bumped off, but because Brenda is going to be starting recertifying 
for people that already have their minimum hours in, um, I am upping it to recording the hours a couple times a week um, just to make sure that she, you can still continue adding your hours, but for the, the 35 hours that are required for recertification, um, I'm working with Brenda to make sure she has all the people that have completed a minimum of 35 hours. Sure. Very good. Okay, very good. Okay. So and I, I would like to to give a big thank you to Brenda. This is Karen, who I went down to South Bend and she really helped me and has con is continuing to help. So anybody that needs help, these coordinators are awesome. There you go. Let that be recorded on our video and pushed out to the world. Yeah. And it is it is significant work, right? Because as we've noted, right, we have to have these. Um, we have to have our coordinators, and so it's 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 an imperative that they they are they are a critical part of the program. Okay. Thanks, Alina, and Brenda. Okay, so reminder here about uh, about our priorities here as we're as we're as we're uh, as we're getting ready to think about. Uh, um, you know, as we, the, you know, uh, finishing up the year and that uh, preparing for training, um, I'm going to be quite excited myself actually to see how the training evolves into 2024 to capture these emphases and it, um, and to see how all these, that, uh, how all these emphases are going to play out, um, that, uh, in training, uh, this is, that uh, it's going to be an interesting, that, um, perspective to see how that, um, how that connects up and it, um, um, uh, 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 it's and I, I want to make a note, right? That I just really, really want to emphasize. We start thinking about climate change as something that we are talking about as master gardeners, right? This is something that uh, it should be in our vocabulary. It should be, you know, we, we should be comfortable talking about that with the public uh, that engages us. Um, uh, so there, there should not be climate change deniers amongst us, um, you know, and it uh, issues about uh, plant biodiversity and that uh, pollinators and so forth also should be, you know, we should be comfortable knowing and conversing in this, um, these activities here. And of course, wildfire preparedness, you know, as one of these eight emphasis, you know, as this is indeed quite significant that, um, that a lot of these topics that we have concerned ourselves with, you know, are now focuses or foci uh, of the, uh, of the, of the program here uh, for this, uh, for the upcoming year. So good things to think about. Okay, so we're going to wait. Um, Doug has not joined us yet, uh, and I actually told Doug that you know that we we typically run till about ten forty um, uh, on our announcements and our program. So at, uh, we're, let's we're going to vamp a little bit, but I'd like to do some thoughts and, and uh, some preparations uh, for when Doug joins us here, uh, because um, his specialty course is soil, you know, and it's just on on soil conditions and soil testing and so so forth. Um, I wanted to. I specifically reached out to Doug to um, ask him to join us today to speak about biosolids, you know, and how safe are all of the uh, compost that we're getting from um, municipal sewers, uh, uh, sewage treatment um, uh, plants. Um, it's a big deal down here in Long Beach. You know, it's very inexpensive to buy all this, right? You know, but how safe is actually all this stuff that uh, all this, uh, the compost that comes from our poop? And so this is the uh, that's the uh, and the the answer I think is going to be fairly safe although you know because it you um, but it just it it does give you pause right when you start thinking about you're putting this on your vegetable garden you know and it, uh, what other kind of concerns do you want to be thinking about um, um, this of course you know this is a uh, this this also leads into thoughts about you know where you get your compost and where you're composting from when you start thinking about horse manure and even cow manure you know. Um, what sort of um, 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 hormones and um, antibiotics and other um, additives might have been in their feed that are now part of their feces that go into their compost? And that um, it's interesting to start thinking about um, just what is the chemical nature of the compost that we're then applying um, in our garden in our garden areas. And so I would you know I would hope that that would uh, this is the kind of this is the kind of the thoughts I wanted to, to bring out you know to it uh, to our discussion to our discussion with uh, uh, with Doug. That's a really good point about the antibiotics 
and stuff like E. coli from cows and um, growth hormones from cows. Yeah, that's a good point. And it, it, it ties a little bit, Karen, back to the discussion at the at one of the sessions I was at the state conference talking about nutrient deficiencies, right? You know, is that the right. uh, so the the seeds and the the plant varietals that we've bred so successfully for yield across the planet have just that's resulted in a change in the chemistry. Yeah, I was at that workshop also. It's very, very disappointing, especially when you get to be my age and your appetite is not as large and and you're still trying to get your nutrition from your food <laughs> so you know how are you going to eat more if you don't have room to eat more to get the nutrition so yes that's it's very uh very thought provoking what's Carrie referring to is that one of the points that the instructor made is that hey if you want to get the same amount of nutrients that you were getting you've got to eat more so, you know, you just you eat a third more of your vegetables in order to get the same nutritional value you would have had 20 years ago. So it doesn't seem like a right, you know, right answer to a solution. Mike? Kelly, you and I had a discussion about growing tomatoes and you had educated me about not being able to grow tomatoes in the same location year after year after year. And uh, I, I wasn't quite aware of that. And we were discussing why my tomatoes weren't growing very good. Do you think Doug will cover that uh, part on what, what can I do to uh, allow me to plant tomatoes in the same location next year? Can I do it or do I have to, you know, like your advice was you need to relocate for a couple of years? Rotation. Yeah, no, that's a good one. Let's, let's, let's make sure we, let's, let's make sure we, we push that to Doug. And rotation is is an age old way to get the best yields, Mike. But I was gonna, Mike. I was gonna uh, come back at you and talk about soil amendments. You know, is it? Uh, what, you know, where do you think emu poop is going to rank in terms of it uh, quality at uh, quality compost? Well, first you got to collect it, and I'm not going to collect the emu poop because it's spread out all over the past year so where it lays is where it stays but to build on what you're saying it'll be interesting to see what it does to the soil and to the grass that's growing there um, when they defecate it's kind of like a a goose poo it's as greasy as goose poo and it's a sizable pile and it absolutely just smothers that spot in the ground and so i've been kind of taking a look at it when I go out there to see what is going to happen to the past year. Is it going to, uh, is it going to grow? Is it going to benefit or is it going to stifle the growth? Is it too hot in that one particular location to allow um, growth in that area? And uh, I don't know what to say. I don't know, but I'm not going to collect it, go out and scoop it up and put it in the, in the compost pile. I'm just going to pay attention to to the, the past year to see what happens. Well, I can't imagine. I would think the smothering is going to be exactly what you're experiencing here. I can't imagine that uh, you're, you're, it's it's the, that you're, we're going to get much growth of anything um, out of that. It's, uh, yeah, it's so thick and heavy. The, uh, the amount of feces that comes out in this big plot and, and it just stays there and it, it's going to take quite a bit to break it up, whether it's the sun coming out, drying it up, and it breaks up into smaller pieces, or the rain coming in, breaking that pile up and washing it out some. But for that immediate impact area, it, it's pretty suffocating. And that was something that I, I noticed is going to possibly be an issue. I don't know. Well, this again could be another money raiser we could think about from a foundation standpoint, because uh, we could, you know, you have cow chip tossing contest right in rural america and so i think emu chip tossing could be a uh, you know an athletic event we could introduce here to the peninsula well again you have to go out and collect it and i'm not going to go out and collect it put it in my food dehydrator dry it and then like flick it like a bottle cap in, in your hand so uh, I'll, I'll pass on that okay okay well it was, it was just an idea we'll, we'll think about that 
What else is people using for it, uh, you know, for uh, fertilizers and soil amendments? What are they thinking about? Um, I just picked up a, a bag of a 16, 16, 16 <laughs> that I intend to, to, to be using, uh, just general fertilizer. Um, what are people's thoughts regarding how they intend to amend their gardens or landscapes this fall? Chicken manure. Chicken manure, your own chickens then? Mm-hmm. So you are picking up your chicken manure. Well, when we clean out the coop or just fertilizing in place because we move our chickens every week and they scratch and deposit and and then one of the best things you can do is run chickens after larger animals because they'll break up that manure and allow it to uh, break down in the soil An interesting thought mike do you think do you think chickens in amongst the emus would work in terms of breaking some of that up Sure, you see a lot of farms where there's co-mingling of the animals, whether it's sheep, goats, little miniature horses, cows, chickens, geese, turkeys. And so you see a lot of videos with them co-mingling and you know that they're um, breaking apart the other species feces and um, well, there's limited nutritional value, but there still is some in there. And it's like Aaron and I had talked about, you know, giving that chicken manure time to age a little bit too, because it, it, it can be um, detrimental to just take it out and, and put it someplace unless it's going to be, um, ha have a chance to air out a little bit. Uh, and that's the advantage of rabbit manure. Rabbit manure, the soiled straw in a pen can be taken out of the pen, soaking wet, dripping with the urine and with the rabbit pellets. And you can put it right on your garden, put it right around a fruit tree. And it's uh, uh, not that hot, so to speak, where it causes damage and, and the plants just love it. I've raised rabbits for years and years and so it wasn't uncommon to be able to do that. But using uh, good discretion and having a range uh, area is important so you don't get blackfoot disease where chickens and turkeys range together. You'll get a, a specific problem in a closed up coop, but in a range environment uh, it really makes, a, a, reduces that potential for the Blackfoot disease between the two of them. So Doug, I'm pleased you're joining us. You can, hear, you, can, you can pick up on the conversation we're having here in terms of actually just thinking about, okay, how are we gonna be amending our gardens and our landscapes through this fall? And uh, the individual who was just speaking, Mike Carvia, has uh, quite the menagerie up here at, uh, near the coast. And he's, uh, his, he is as an emu farmer, you know, along with sheep and goats and chickens. And, that, uh, and you know, and I, I guess, you know, keep on going, Mike, in terms of what else you're having up there, you know. Uh, well, pheasants and turkeys and broiler chickens and egg laying chickens. And so uh, a nice, uh, diverse collection. Yeah, fantastic. Lots so, of good fertilizer. So, you know, at, uh, I'm going to stop the share and just, uh, first of all, just welcome you, Doug, you know, in terms of, because it is, it's a thrill to have, you know, to have you here. And mind you, it's, it's usually appreciative, mind you, taking taking the time to come and speak with us, right? You know, because uh, uh, we hugely value, I we, we those of us who were at the state conference um, last week, by the way, uh, we heard your name mentioned more than once, right? Because um, since uh, Dr. Cogger has retired, right, you know, you are the guy, you are the soils guy. And so at the... Uh, People are saying, yeah, we talked to Doug about this. And have you read Doug's paper on this? Right. You know, so it, uh, so, you yeah, know, we, uh, I gave a tour uh, here to some folks of our um, current research from the master, from that conference. From that conference. Very good. Anyway, so welcome here today. And I said some of the questions we wanted to deal with today and it, um, and reach out today actually begin with biosolids and begin with that. Um, I think you and I spoke about this as well in terms of it. Um, we're getting more and more, um, you know, um, you know I, I don't want to say pressure, but certainly advertisements and marketing from municipalities about taking the biosolids, you know, from their sewage treatment plants and using those as, um, as soil amendments. And it, um, I wanted to make sure that we as master gardeners are as equipped as we should be in terms of talking to the public regarding, okay, how safe are those, right? You know, and what uh, uh, what kind of consideration should be thought about regarding where we get our soil amendments and where we place them, either in our gardens or in our landscapes, or how do we want to use them? 
Yeah, uh, well, so biosolids are um, definitely highly regulated and there's a class A and class B biosolids as, as a sort of first, anything that can be, you know, land applied has to be either class A or class B. And <clears throat> that is just uh, the extent of pathogen reduction that goes on. So, you know, there's a lot of, of pathogens to worry about coming through sewage treatment. And so the uh, the focus with the class A and class B is on the extent of pathogen reduction. So class A has sort of the highest level of um, pathogen reduction. Class B can still be land applied, but there is an understanding that there will be some further pathogen reduction after application. So class B would be a very poor choice, you know, for like a home garden or really any kind of vegetable farming situation. Um, and then there's also something called exceptional quality uh, class A. And so the those meet both this pathogen reduction and they have to demonstrate a level of um, metal uh, of low, you know, um, heavy metals content or trace trace elements because uh, arsenic is not exactly a metal and selenium is not exactly a metal. So um, they, they have to meet these uh, trace element levels to be exceptional quality class A. And so, you know, products that, and those are, are considered to be perfectly safe um, for application on a home garden I, I would say, you know, and, and uh, I'm not sure exactly. I mean, this is not my sort of area of expertise. And, and, you know, I know that there's a lot of science underway. So there was, a you know, historically, there was a lot of concern around heavy metals. And there were um, processes taken to reduce the amount of heavy metals. I looked at some um, data that showed, you know, heavy metals in sewage sludge from 1981 compared to, I think it was like, you know, the late nineties and there was a huge reduction in heavy metals. And that's, that, that was due to um, efforts to reduce the metals that are going into that sewage treatment flow. And, and so those methods were very effective and the heavy metals were were highly reduced, and and now, you know, now there's all this testing to make to make sure that they stay um, at this low level. There is what we would call con contaminants of emerging concern, and so these are the other things that aren't heavy metals, um, which are in the sewage treatment system, um, pharmaceuticals, um, PFAS. Uh, what are that polyfluorinated aromatic substances um, and a bunch of, you know, things that, again, I'm not an, an expert in. And there's some research going on in that area. Um, if there's any questions so far. No, this is this is good coming up in terms of this, this, this whole point. There. So to your knowledge, you know, that the class A or B or exceptional, that should be advertised that we should be able to know. Right. You know, that yeah, should be, they, I, should, they should. Yeah, I was poking around a little bit, uh, Tagro. I didn't. I went to their FAQ site and I thought it would show that, but I'm. I would be ninety nine point nine percent sure that Tagro, for example, is an exceptional quality. Um, and and that they would actually uh, list that. So that that's kind of a. It's kind of like an FDA. You, you actually. Uh, we we have assurance that if someone's going to post that they are class A or class B, or that they should know what class they are. Sorry about that. My computer blanks out sometimes, but <laughs> are you there? Yeah, we're here. Yeah. Yeah. No, I absolutely, they should. Um, and I was surprised that, you know, I, I, it's one of those things where I wonder if they're a little bit, you know, I'm just looking at Tigra's website. I mean, I personally, I don't, I don't live in Tacoma. I would not have any hesitation in using Tagro, um, really, or any like Class A um, 
you know, exceptional quality product. But it's one of the things that we should, we should be looking for and we should be expecting that, you know, yeah. if you're, if you can be using a biosolid compost, right, there should be some sort of labeling, uh, that's that, that, uh, and, and I, I certainly know from the municipality that, that we get, uh, compost from they're actually, you know, it is, you can, you have the sheet of the, of what, of what, of the testing, you know, so. It, yeah. Uh, well, right. So it's a fantastic source of nutrients. Um, you know, the research I do here in Puyallup is primarily uh, almost exclusively actually on um, certified organic land and biosolids, whatever class, whatever quality are still not allowed on organic um you know are not allowed in organic certification so again that's another key point to focus on right you know so if you right want to or, use that yeah. yeah right or wrong that is the regulation yeah so you if that is something you know as a home gardener you're you're probably not certified organic um but if you look to those standards for guidance then you know, that would not be allowed. And if you are a certified organic farmer, then you definitely, that would, that would jeopardize your certification. Yeah. So I don't put it on my soil here for that. <laughs> so what do you, I'm curious. So what do you amend, right? To maintain that, that class, that, that, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, what, what, what are you going to be using this fall, for example? Yeah, well, so in our research, that, that's a great question. And um, we are, what my, my research primarily in, in organic agriculture primarily focuses on disturbance and reducing disturbance. And we also have a um, compost um, factor. So we have um, three different systems that we're looking at with sort of three different levels of intensity of disturbance a highly disturbed, um, a minimally reduced tillage. And then the third one is an animal integrated. We did, this was our first year of this long-term experiment and we didn't have animals on it this year, but I hope to next year and we'll have sheep is the plan. And that one I'm kind of using like a medium amount of disturbance when we do need to disturb because we still grow vegetables there. So it's like a vegetable animal rotation. And then we apply compost to half of the plots as well to see that interaction and then the compost we use will um the stuff we used last year we made here during our compost uh, facility operator training class which happens starts next week no week a week from monday um no that's what is it it must be monday <laughs> a week from yesterday uh we'll start our compost facility operator training and so for that training, I bring in a bunch of different organic amendments and the people that take the training, um, well, we build some piles before they get here. We try to do things wrong. <laughs> so we build sort of five piles and four of them, we do something wrong when we're building the pile. And then um, and we do that about three days before the class comes. And that's a good amount of time to see like what kind of temperature spike you're gonna get, for example. And then on the first day, um, or maybe it's the second day the class um, gets together in groups and they build their own piles using these materials that we've pulled together. And then when the class is all over, I, I pull all that material together and make a giant um, compost pile. And then that's the stuff that I use, we'll, we'll be using for the experiment. So it, I, I, you, you have to ask, right? I have to ask, right? What what are the things you're doing wrong? What what are the oh. uh, yeah? It's, what, what are the do, wrong? Uh, we'll make a pile that's um, too wet. Okay. We'll make a pile that's too dry. Although that might be hard to accomplish now. Um, we will make a pile that has too much nitrogen um, and too little nitrogen. Mm -hmm. So I guess the, the balance, yeah, of, of everything that needs to happen on this thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and some of the other, you know, uh, air porosity is one of the other factors. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, to try to make a pile that has too much nitrogen, but still has enough porosity, you know, I think we can accomplish that. We have chicken manure. So the materials we, we bring in are um, chicken manure, 
dairy manure, um, fair waste from the Puyallup Fair. Yeah. And then yard waste from um, the Tacoma. Uh, it's called the Compost Factory, I think. But it's owned by a, a different company at this point. Is there an ideal mix when you start thinking about that? So there, I, I can see there's food waste, there's animal waste, right? You know, and there's yard waste. Is there kind of, a, I'm curious, is there, is there a, 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 your recipe? Is it, is there a blend that you yeah, look so for? In that, in that class, we go through um, something called the compost calculator, um, which is a tool available um, from WSU Extension. And to use the compost calculator, you have to know the carbon to nitrogen ratio and the moisture content of those feedstocks. Um, you know, for most people, I would say that's probably a little um, more sciencey than we need to get. Um, you probably heard some of the golden rules about like a, you know, a mixture of browns and greens. Yeah. Where the exception to that is, you know, manures would be considered more of like a green, a high nitrogen, even though they're not green, even though they're not green, they're brown. But um, so a mixture of kind of high nitrogen materials and lower nitrogen materials. But the compost calculator, if you do have that information, you can put together a recipe and you can target, for example, like an initial C to N ratio of 25 to 1 or something like that. Yeah. Um, an initial moisture content of 60% or 55%. But um, we do teach students about the hand squeeze test. So you can do a, you can squeeze your material as you're mixing it and um, test the moisture um, as you're going along. So the way that works is uh, if it's, I think if it's 60, if it's 60%, you can squeeze really hard and just start to see moisture kind of beating up a little bit. And if it's in the 55 to 60 range, it will definitely leave like a wetness on your hand, mm -hmm. but it would be hard to get actual moisture out of it if you're like 55 degrees or 55%. And then below that, you know, it doesn't really hold its structure very well if it's very dry. And then if it's above 65, it's, it's kind of like, like you squeeze it in like a lot of water. A lot of water's coming out. Yeah. So you pick it up and it's just dripping wet. Um, so yeah, you don't want to be too high in moisture that will that will start to uh, affect the porosity. So one of the at, uh, I wanted to go ahead and do a quick share here. Mike was kind enough to dig up the Long Beach biosolids information sheet, right? And exactly to your point in terms of what you're looking at here is that yeah, they do say okay, you know, we meet the Class A reduction uh -huh. standards in this WAC. Um, and it, cool. you know, and it, uh, and, and, and they are saying is that, okay, we, you know, we meet exceptional class, yeah, exceptional, exceptional quality, quality, right? Yeah, yeah. Yep. So again, what that means is they are do, they are accountable to both a uh, process that reduces pathogens and to testing for trace elements. as they go through here, I mean, they're actually going through and actually talking about, you know, at, uh, quite a bit in terms of, okay, here's, here's, what, here's what we need to be thinking about if you're thinking about using this. Right. And I think at this point, they're going to turn their attention more to the nutrient when they're telling you how, how to think about applying it. So it's basically very similar to applying a compost um, at that point. Right. So when they're talking about how to, uh, how to use it, uh, I don't think there's, they're not going to be saying like, you know, don't over apply trace elements. They're basically held to the same rules for trace elements that composters are. Yeah. So, you know, a commercial compost versus a, a commercial biosolids is basically held to the same standards. And so they go in, you know, this is the, at uh, their level, they're, they're testing. Yeah. Yeah. That's the same for compost. Any, I'm curious about uh, this. These, I guess, the limits in the uh, in the table there. I mean, those are those are the WAC limits. Um, 
and I guess they're not, um, it's curious, they're not actually putting in their, in, in this, um, in this form online, they don't have the, the I guess the, you're, you're not seeing what the composite sample would be. I'm presuming that when you, um, if you actually were picking up compost, Mike, do you know this? If you're picking up compost, would they actually, would that be filled in, I guess, the, 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 the parts per million on the chemical? Uh, a lot of the parts per million on the chemicals are those tests are done at the sewage treatment plant. And my experience working in the waterworks industry, and that's where they would you'd get the, those figures from and making sure that they follow the, the guidelines put forth by the state and the federal government. So the sewage treatment plant has access to that data. Is, is that correct, Doug? Uh, I, I would expect to get that from the composter itself, you know, like, especially if they're mixing it with anything. Um, a lot of people like, so one of the methods you can use for, to get from sort of class A to, to get from class B to class A is actually composting. So <clears throat> I would, you know, I, I think the. I don't know. Maybe both both things might be true, Mike. Where the the information is available for the material going into the biosolids, but also I would want I would imagine they would have it available for what you're buying. Yeah. And so, obviously, Mike, you you pick this up off their website, so it obviously it's not going to be. This is just going to be a generic template that they're pushing up up there. They don't have it. Um, you know, obviously that I'm I'm presuming that um, if we were to go down there today and buy a and buy a truck truckload you would have uh, this this the sample data would be filled out based upon when it was last tested that would be my guess yeah but yeah they probably are composting it like so <clears throat> there's a there's different processes that are allowed to go from class b to class a and so thermal treatment where you can literally just kind of cook it is one there's a high ph high temperature process and then there's um composting yeah. And I assume, you know, composting is the most common. So then so they're gonna they're gonna mix it with something. Yeah. Sort of bulking material. Yeah, that's what they're using by an aerobic composting process. Yeah. So again, so so the message in fr from our standpoint, or from our standpoint, as master gardeners, right, as you know, is that we should actually have some sort of attestation from the provider of these biosolids, just as we're looking at here, right? They should be able to know what they're claiming, and it uh, and obviously they're putting up, you know, Don's, um, you know, Don's contact information right there, saying, hey, you know, give me a call, and we'll we'll talk about uh, the qualities are there. The, the point, though, that you're making, I think it's important to emphasize that if you want to go, if you're trying to go organic, right, this is not, you know, this is, this is, this is, this, this is not, not the path. That is true. Yes. Okay. I'm curious from others in the, on the, others in the call here, is it uh, composting problems or challenging problems with amendments this year? Is it, uh, uh, Don, uh, uh, Doug, before you joined, right, Mike was saying he's not going to be collecting his emu poop. And it, uh, you know, but it, uh, you know, but it, uh, uh, but Aaron was actually is, is using it, uh, her chicken manure as it, uh, as, and just moving her chickens around, you know, her landscape, right, you know, just to gain that uh, chicken yeah. manure spread. I mean, this is a time of year to be careful with, you know, this isn't probably the, the most highly recommended time of year to apply manure um, to the soil because of the risk of leaching of, of ammonium or nitrate, really. So if, um, yeah, if you have a high high nitrogen manure, like chicken manure, chicken manure has a lot of ammonium in it, and that ammonium can be well lost by a, a volatilization as ammonia, or it can be oxidized to nitrate, and then it's going to be leached out pretty easily. So, so, you, so your concern really is just, it's not with applying it so much, but this is, the value is going to be just lost because of leaching well, the value but it's also a water quality hazard so okay yeah, yeah. both, both yeah. things um so i would say at this point it's pretty late and not even advisable at all you can make a fall application of compost or manure you know earlier like 
early September maybe, and then follow that up with a, a cover crop yeah. planting, you know, that has enough time to get established. Um, and then that cover crop can, will, you know, especially like a, a grass or grain cover yeah. crop. Yeah. Will really effectively scavenge. But this stuff all has to happen, you know, like September 15th, kind of getting the cover crop into the ground. Then it has enough time to get some roots and, and be able to actually, you know, carry over, u utilize that. Well, are there any fall applications of compost or fertilizer that you're recommending at this point? I mean, as at the, I mean, just, so, really just hold, good. just hold off. It's just, it's just too late. Right. It's too late. I mean, it's just, yeah, I can, like, if it was something really like almost a mulch, you know, like yeah, it had like no available nitrogen in it. So that's where I was going to go with. So, you know, other than mulching, right. You know. Yeah. Like wood chips or something would be fine. They don't have any, they don't have any available nitrogen really. Um, I, let me see. I was just, so we just sent off our samples to the lab for this class. Um, but I can pull up last year's just give me a second. And you can share a screen if you have something to share. So we were noting that um, at the at the state conference, right, they were making a big push on cover crops, you know, and it um, and a lot of us here in Western Washington were complaining that our cover crops have not been that successful, and we've not had it, we've not been very successful in growing cover crops. But the messaging were don't don't give up on it, you know, just keep at it, you know. There's, oh there's... yeah, um, definitely, don't give up. Cover crops are wonderful. Okay. Is there a favorite mix, seed mix, or species mix that uh, that you're finding especially successful here in Western Washington? Our, um, let's see, you guys see a fair waste report? Yep, we got it. Uh, yeah, I would say, you know, we use, our, our go-to mix is really cereal rye um, and vetch. I, um, I really like Lana vetch which is, it's a woolly pod vetch, but it's pretty much the same thing as a hairy vetch. And the rye, you know, especially as it gets later and later, you know, we, we target sort of September 15th for a planting date. Um, and it's really interesting. I've been watching things pretty closely this year because we did a lot of planting like September 15th onward. And the clovers and vetches that were planted around September 15th, they really take off and kind of were up and out even before the rye. And then when I did similar mixes planted around October 1st, it's like, you're still looking for the vetch, but the rye's already up. So as it gets later, rye, you know, is, is the thing that you might still have some luck with. <laughs> um, and I, I don't know how late is too late to where you're wasting your, your time. But uh, yeah, I just planted some some of that over the weekend. Oh, really? So even even this weekend? So even even October, you're still planting yeah, some rye at, at my house. Not nothing that was sort of an official experiment. I got those all. You know, I got those all planted. I guess it was last week though. So we were we were into the beginning of October with some of that stuff. But we we planted a whole bunch on uh, on September fifteenth, and it looks fantastic. What are we looking at now? Okay, so yeah, I did these fair those four um, amendments I mentioned, and I guess I thought this would be interesting. This is the fair waste, which I would assume would be one of the ones that had, you know, the let's see, the CETA in is fifty three. So yeah, fifty three, we would consider that to be uh, a low nitrogen um, material, but even this material has quite a bit of available uh you know that that ammonium nitrogen that's pretty high so uh, so this is this is tip you're saying this is the food waste you got from the puyallup fair fair waste but okay okay so this might look a lot like if you've got animals you know and they're on bedding indoors this would be similar 
to what that, you know, when it comes in, it looks a lot like wood shavings with manure mixed into it and some straw. Yeah. So, you know, on the whole, if you take all that material, dry it and grind it up and then analyze the carbon to nitrogen, there's a lot of carbon in there. But I guess my point is there's also a lot of nitrogen that's like readily available. You know, all that in that manure, um, there's quite a bit of readily available so 50, like the number we really focus on is the C to N ratio when we're doing our recipes. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so this is, this is pretty ripe stuff. This just, this just came from the fair. This had, this, this fair waste had not been composted. That's right. Yeah. And it's very heterogeneous. Uh, this year we, we mixed it up quite a bit. Um, heterogeneous and that, that multiple speed, uh, Cows, sheep, chickens. I mean, uh, uh, like this side has a lot of straw in it. This side's got a lot of wood shavings in it. You know, that kind of not well mixed. Okay. Um, this is dairy manure. So the report looks a little different because it's a manure. I don't know why. But again, so a much lower C, and C to N ratio. Yeah, so lower C to N means um, more nitrogen relative to carbon. But less, you know, even less available ammonium, almost no available nitrate. Is that a general and just in dairy waste? Do you find that uh, to be the case then? Yeah, I mean, dairy waste, we don't consider, you know, a dairy waste, you can pretty much like it's kind of compacted. Um, but if you could mix it with some wood chips or something, it would compost nicely. Like it's pretty, you know, 32 is not a bad starting spot for making compost. It's not going to be super hot, but I imagine it would still get to temperature. Um, especially with like an aerated system, it's going to be a little too dense. Like if you just yeah. leave it by itself. Um, and then the yard waste. So yeah, you would need a kind of a wood chipper to get this kind of material so this they bring this to us already chipped and so this is more than just grass clippings here yeah this has got some wood in it for sure probably a decent amount of grass this time of year more ammonium than i would expect but not much nitrate and then for the really high ammonium. So 8,000. <laughs> wow. Where is this? Yeah. What's this? What's this from? Chicken manure. This is what? chicken manure from um, Wilcox. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So they do, they have a really nice product that organic farmers across the state really covet because um, they don't mix it at all with uh, bedding. So a C to N of seven, it's just really crazy. But when you get it though, it's not been composted. It is really this hot. It is, yeah. It is really, really hot. But I guess to your point, though, this starts speaking to the quality of of um, of um, once it is composted. Right. You're starting to see this is the this is kind of the characteristics of chicken manure versus steer slash dairy manure, um, you know, as it, uh, in terms of compost elements. What you're starting with is a very different product, very different material. Can you. Say well, that again. So what I'm trying to get to here is that you know is that you know is that when I th when I think about the end product you might buy at the landscape nursery, a chicken manure or a steer manure, right? You know, you're getting a sense that's a that's a that's a you know post composting, but here here now you're getting a good sense of what the pre material is, what the yeah, starting. So the company that we used actually we used a company to go get our um, to go pick up this manure for us, and they actually sell chicken manure at at the the landscape company. And that's not, it's not composted. I think they mix it with some wood shavings. When, so they're getting it in and doing like a little mix, but it's not compost. So they shouldn't be selling it as, you know, chicken manure compost, but somebody else might sell chicken manure compost. I know there's people that sell dairy manure compost. 
And then if, yeah. you know, if, if you're calling it compost, um, it better be composting. Okay, Sharon, yeah. Sharon has a question. Yeah. Uh, I, I sometimes have used uh, alfalfa pellets mm -hmm. mixed in with soil. Is that a good practice? And is there any animal uh, waste that, that uh, meets a nitrogen uh, threshold? So yeah, that to take the second question first, that's why the chicken manure is so coveted by organic farmers <laughs> uh, around the state because they can get this chicken manure and um, Wilcox has a process where they dry it out pretty well. Um, so it's not, you know, it's not super wet. And yeah, that man, that material ha has a lot of nitrogen and, and you can definitely meet the nitrogen requirements um, for any any crop with that material, you know, you'd have to do the math about how much you need to apply over how many acres. Um, there are, we use a lot of, it's called feather meal. And that's um, a product that's 11% nitrogen. Uh, that would be in terms of C to N, but um, it's, you know, we use that material and because we have a lot of phosphorus already in our soil. So we're oftentimes just looking for a product that's high in nitrogen. And so a feather meal product we buy is 1100. So 11% nitrogen and, and basically no um, phosphorus and potassium. It's called feather or feta? Feather. Okay. But again, that's a that's the basis of best based upon your soils, right? Because you have that. It sounds like you've you've you're concerned about yeah, phosphorus. Yeah. yeah. So if you you know based on a phosphorus test, um, you may want to look for a different fertilizer, or you know, and and then composts and manures are going to have a lot of phosphorus in them too, which is how which is why we have so much phosphorus in our soil. It used to be they used to do a lot of dairy research here, so a lot of dairy manure applied over years, years and years and years. So we have lifetimes of phosphorus in our soil. This is part of what makes life interesting for us, Doug, you know, in Grays Harbor and Pacific counties here, right? Because it ranges from, you know, you have soils deep in the Chehalis River Valley, right? You know, good loam, you know, all the way out here to the coast, we're, we're just on sand, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and so precipitation values uh, vary a lot relative to the hundred plus inches we get here at the coast, right? We've had over an inch already today. Right. You know, and then it, uh, and then varying to a more normal 30 to 40 inches right inland, you know, and it uh, as you start approaching Thurston County. So it becomes a, you know, it's it's it really is a question. This is, you know, we, we deal with a variety of um, of soil types and climate conditions upon which, uh, you know, people are composting and fertilizing and amending the soils. But Sharon had what was your first question? Um... Uh, I sometimes have used alfalfa pellets. <laughs> Oh, right. Yeah. So alfalfa pellets are going to be very low. <clears throat> I think about 2% nitrogen. So that feather meal was 11% and alfalfa might be two, two and a half percent. So it, if, you know, you would have to apply five times as much. I see. Just to get that same amount of nitrogen, but really it's even more complicated than that. You probably have to apply like 10 times as much or 20 times as much because the way organic fertilizers work is it's not all made available right away. That's what's nice about them is they're, we call it, you know, they're kind of slow release fertilizers and what determines how quickly and how completely the nitrogen that's in there gets um, made available is the amount you actually start with. So um, when you start with uh, a lower amount of nitrogen, like two and a half percent, then um, probably only about 25% of the nitrogen that's in there is actually going to be made available in the first year. And then um, later, you know, over the year, basically building the soil organic matter. So you're going to get more, like you're going to still, that nitrogen might be available more in the second year and third year. I see. So, but with a 11 zero, zero, like with a, a higher nitrogen, a blood meal or a feather meal, almost all of that nitrogen will be made available um, in the first year. So we usually use about 75% if we're trying to, trying to scope that out. But Thank you. Yeah. 
So it, they almost like those blood meals and feather meals almost work like a commercial fertilizer there. They're so high in nitrogen. Doug, we want to talk about biochar as well, right? Because it, oh. uh, you know, WSU has recently, you know, has just just in the past couple of years, right, has finally put out, you know, at, um, you know, some profiles about biochar and its uh, its ability to be used. And it, um, and of course, people talk about the need to charge the biochar, right, or to compost it prior to using. You know, are there thoughts and reflections, and are there is there any uh, testing and experimentation that you're you're working with under biochar? Yeah, I've done mostly research with uh, co-composting biochar. So we use it as a feedstock in our um, compost research. And that works really well. We we looked, we did some research specifically looking at the ability for the biochar to reduce nitrogen loss. So when you do take, for example, like that chicken manure and you try to make compost out of it, you're going to lose quite a bit of nitrogen, um, just starting with that much ammonium. Um you know, it's, it's hard to, to not lose um, nitrogen through volatilization. And we found that the biochar did really help in terms of reducing nitrogen loss um, during the composting process. And the other thing we found is that a lot more of the nitrogen at the end of the product would be in the uh, process would be in the nitrate form versus the ammonium form. And that uh, probably just has to do with the biochar ability to create more bulk, more porosity in the pile um, and, you know, allowing oxygen to get in there. So oxygen is going to really determine whether you, whether nitrogen moves from ammonium to nitrate. Uh, we say when the ammonium gets oxidized, you know, then it makes, it converts to nitrate and nitrate's a much more stable form of nitrogen. Uh, in the material. So ammonium is not very stable because it can be lost as ammonia. So that was a good finding. I think uh, in talking to composters, you know, some of them are more interested in taking the biochar and finished compost and kind of mixing them together after the fact. And I don't have any uh, direct experience with that, but I, I do like that idea. I've seen some research where, um, biochar was mixed with you know chicken manure or different things and then applied and I, I think that's smart because um biochar has like the benefits that are cited for soils are increasing the surface area it's increasing the you know the nutrient holding capacity but if you apply biochar that doesn't have any nutrients on it already then you know it can behave kind of like a sink for nutrients so nutrients in the soil might go to the biochar, but not necessarily, you know, there's going to be a, a an equilibrium of availability versus what's on, on the surface area. And so first you kind of have to fill up all the surface area and then that might shift, you know, um, the availability. So we don't see a lot of, um, we don't see a lot of yield increase with just biochar applied by itself. You know, you might see some changes in soil quality parameters like cation exchange capacity or water holding capacity, but you're not going to, you might see a fertility, you know, detriment, which is definitely going to affect yield. So the research where they've taken biochar and mixed it with um, feather or, you know, chicken manure, for example, and then applied it, they did see some synergy where they, you know, it was better than the chicken manure alone or the biochar alone. And that could be related to that increase in soil health parameters. So, so, so that's a key point there is that, you know, is that biochar by itself, right, may actually end up just, you know, taking away nutrients from the plants you're trying to work with. So, you know, so, yeah. so you know, so, so mix it in with compost, mix it in with manure, right, you know, and that, uh, and then apply that mixture. Yeah. And, um, you know, the benefits, like I said, are, um, well, there's a lot of interest in it for just sort of carbon sequestration. Yep. Um, it is a very stable form of carbon. I, a lot of the new research on soil carbon indicates that, you know, there isn't really a type of soil organic matter that is um, stable in the soil. And, and by stable, you know, you mean, we mean um, it can't be, broken down by microorganisms so you know they're like as organic matter enters the soil 
the location where that organic matter ends up is more important than sort of this chemical attribute of the of the material itself. So some of organic matter will end up tightly bound on clay, clay particles, and that material is kind of protected from microbes, or some of it will end up in aggregates, and that material is protected from microbes until you break up the aggregate. But um, biochar is kind of the exception to that, where it really is like chemically stable. You know, it's not so much a matter of where it is in the soil. It's just a matter of it is stable carbon because it's been pyrolyzed. Are there unique challenges relative to composting and relative to soil amendments you're seeing now than, say, we've, we've seen in, in years past? I'm curious about, are there new challenges, perhaps related with climate change, perhaps related with, yeah, uh, you know, with the, the condition? Yeah. Like I said, the area that I'm really focused on has to do with tillage, and I'd say that there's more interest and um, concern with tilling. Um, you know, organic farmers sometimes get a bad rap for over tilling their soil, uh, and I think that's a trade off. Um, I was talking to some students about this the other day. They were interviewing me about regenerative agriculture and. Um, I was saying that, you know, there's uh, one of the great things about the organic program and the certified organic, it's given farmers, you know, uh, something in the market that they can advertise. And it's, you know, there's a very clear set of guidelines. And one of the benefits to agriculture as a whole is that conventional farmers have oftentimes looked to what the organic farmers are doing and been like, oh, wow, that, you know, why wouldn't I do that if it reduces my input costs? So for example, um, pheromone um, traps or, or pheromone di disruption in uh, Apple industry, I think for Apple calling moth, you know, that, that really started as an organic um, treatment. And then the conventional farmers saw that it worked really well. And then they kind of adapted, adopted that. And I had the thought that, uh, you know, maybe some of the same thing is happening the other direction now with tillage because uh, the reduced tillage has really, you know, the ability to do that, I would say, and no-till, you know, no-till um, grain production um, has been gaining a lot of interest and in, in, um, acreage for decades now. And that's really been made possible by herbicide application. But, you know, through that, we those farmers have really gotten to appreciate their soil health um and seen improvements in their soil health when they stop tilling and i'm wondering you know maybe we're seeing some of it now going the other direction where the organic farmers are looking at that <laughs> and saying well we need to you know improve our soil health um further by not tilling i it's not that simple because you know most organic farmers are growing lots of cover crops they're using compost so they're still getting manure and you know they're still getting organic matter into their soil and and i think that's one of the interesting kind of research angles is you know how much uh like <laughs> what degree of tillage cuz there's a difference between kind of lightly disturbing the soil versus like using a moldboard plow and, yeah. and turning the soil over. So, um, but yeah, I think that's, that's a challenge that a lot of farmers are maybe don't have an answer to right away. Uh, the, they don't have the equipment, you know, a whole new suite of equipment might be necessary to try to um, produce with less tillage. Staying on that same line, though, and it uh, and you mentioned herbicides. Are you starting to see any sort of uh, pest resistance pop up, either microbial or in other pests? You know, to yeah, our traditional herbicides. I don't work with herbicides or or pesticides really, so I'm not um, I'm not super tuned into that in in our agriculture systems. I mean, I know yeah, glyphosate resistance is a is a thing for sure, and um, I've you know I've talked to. Or I've been on some tours with companies that work in producing glyphosate resistant crops. Um, and they were already talking about, you know, what are the next genes that they can stack? Um, so Roundup Ready, you know, soybeans, for example, um, those only work if Roundup kills everything 
except the soybean. And if you start to get resistance to glyphosate, um, then they're going to need uh, a soybean that's resistant to glyphosate and resistant to some other, you know, herbicide, and then they can spray both of those herbicides. So that that is uh, something that I was, you know, a tour I was on in the Midwest eight nine years ago. They were already talking about their new releases, and I'm I'm not sure where we are with that or not. If that's already are you seeing any new pest pop up again, part of either climate change or, you know, or, or pest moving in, migrating into the area? I personally, I, I'm not the right person to answer that. I know colleagues are, are doing some interesting work uh, here. Um, they are, you know, trying to, they're planting like uh century trees, I think that are, you know, trees that are designed to uh, near the port. So the idea is that if anything comes in from the port, you know, it's going to get, that's going to attack this really susceptible tree first and, and then they can, they can watch it. So that's one thing I, I, yeah, just with, with commerce, we're always worried about new pests coming in. Um, I think, yeah, the farmers I deal with, it's kind of this, a lot of, a lot of similar, you know, club root. This has been a problem and still is a problem. Um, that's one we've, we've seen here for sure. And with respect to climate change overall and going back to, you know, bringing it all the way back to soil amendments. I mean, you know, we had such an exceptionally hot and dry summer, right? You know, does it, does the soil chemistry change dramatically or significantly under such, you know, uh, you know, extreme stresses on it, uh, on the, on the, on the, in, in, in the soil itself? I mean, you, we probably had some pretty high soil temperatures, I would think this summer. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think it's going to definitely affect how people farm and, and water use. I, I, you know, given our climate, um, we have a, we have a Mediterranean climate, so it's, you have to be prepared to irrigate in most instances. I, I know there's been a lot of interest in dry land farming um, in Western Washington and that's not going to work in all your soils for sure, but there are instances where there's a, a high water table and people have done some, been successful with squash, you know, for example, planted at the right time, um, being able to get that access water. So that's obviously going to be more challenging in a very dry year, but like, yeah, we, we irrigate our stuff. And so it's, you know, you're just kind of chasing that all the time with it as it gets hotter and drier. But it, but like hot and dry is not really new for Western Washington in the summer. Um, there might be different degrees of it. Last fall, I'm, you know, I'm kind of glad that that didn't become the usual pattern. So it didn't rain until appreciably like November 5th or something, or 6th last year. So that really affected our cropping systems where we tried to plant cover crops so like you would have really had to irrigate we had one field where we did irrigate the before we planted the cover crop and now that, that worked out fine but i just didn't have the time and capacity for a lot of other fields and so i put a lot of seeds into really dry ground like october 1st and just kind of was like okay i hope it rains and then it just didn't you know so if if we see falls like that again you're going to have to really be prepared to irrigate if you want to get any cover crop um established which in a garden you know might not be a big deal but for for farmers it's for any sizable acreage yeah it's going to be a yeah, big a deal yeah. I mean, even if it's just an acre or two right like uh especially if you're accustomed to not doing that and you know, we have this thing about soil sampling, like especially if you want to test your nitrate in your soil, that you were that we recommended doing that by um, October fifteenth, and the reason was is because historically by October fifteenth, we would have had um, about five inches of rain, in typically in Western Washington, and that's the amount of water that it would take to move. Like if you had nitrate in your soil, that's the amount of water it would take to move that nitrate down a, a whole foot. So um, if you're trying to sample the top 12 inches 
um, and you want to see like how much nit and this is a big deal for people that you know dairy farmers for example they apply they need to apply lots of dairy manure but they have to monitor how much nitrate they have in their soil um, in the fall and so they would test between like September 1st and October 15th and if you test after October 15th you would have to go down to two feet because that water that five inches of rain is going to move that nitrogen nitrate down but last year it was like less than an inch for sure before october 15th so um but not this year not the case right <laughs> they're gonna get some rain now so <laughs> you know that final question on cover crops and when do you turn them in in the spring then you know, so if you so if if you were able to plant ideally, right? You know, by September fifteenth, when would you be turning them over? That is a great question, and we've done a lot of work looking at um, the uh, different cover crops, especially for reduced tillage. What we're doing is actually trying to terminate the cover crop without turning it in, without tilling it, and. Um, so in order for that to be effective, we have to wait for the cover crop to flower. And that can be a grain or a vetch, you know, if and and basically once they flower, because these are annual crops. So once they flower, go into that flowering mode, if you mow them, they will not grow back, you know, for the most part. You might see a few, few sprouts here and there, but you can effectively terminate them that way. Now, if you're going to turn the cover crop in then it really um, depends. So with a grain or a grass cover crop, you want to do it um, in the jointing stage of the cover crop. Yeah. Uh, so that's before it, it's the heading, like after jointing would be the um, boot stage, the boot swollen. So you can see this, like if you've ever grown rye, cereal rye, it gets this like boot that's about to flower. And so what happens with a grain is the carbon to nitrogen ratio starts to really change and they become much more carbon rich, much more woody. And that can be a real problem if you let them get very woody and then you you mow them and kind of till them into your soil, then you're going to tie up nitrogen. And that's one of the reasons that a lot of farmers have not used cover crops. Um, I know some of the conventional farmers in this area you know, they get bitten once by by not being able to get out there and terminate their cover crop. And then the cover crop gets very woody. Um, so I'm seeing some of those farmers actually starting to use cover crops now, which is cool. And they're using more of a um, annual uh, ryegrass, which is a little bit, it doesn't have, you know, it's not like a grain where it's going to switch and get very woody. It's a little bit harder to terminate, but they're yeah. using, they're plowing. <laughs> so you know they're definitely gonna gonna terminate that cover crop through plowing, so they're not so worried about whether or not they can kill it. Um, but then vetches are a lot of fun because you can just wait and wait and wait. You know you're not in this hurry. Like it basically the vetches will just put on more and more and more biomass, and that just means more and more and more nitrogen going into your soil. Um, and then uh, so those are those are fun for term like you can wait quite a while. You know, once you see the first flowers, you don't want the vetch to make seed, but once you see those first flowers, you've got you've got quite a while, like weeks before you're going to get anything close to a viable seed. So with a vetch, you can wait until flowering for sure. I, I have yeah. a question uh, regarding uh, soil probes. Uh, they test pH. How does a nitrogen affect the uh, plus or minus uh, pH. Can you test it since you're talking about nitrogen fixation with the rain in our sandy soil a foot down? So there's some commercial uh, probes that are about a foot long oh. for soil testing. And it gives moisture, pH, and uh, sunlight. So what would be the guidance there for making recommendations? Yeah, I think they're those probes. I don't have a ton of familiarity with them. Um, the pH, like the pH can change quite a bit. Uh, 
you know, over weeks, I don't know about days, but it can change. So when you, when you do a soil test and you get the pH results, there's actually a specific thing you want to look at or make sure you tested for, which is called the Lyme requirement. Ah. And the Lyme requirement is much more valuable than just like an instantaneous pH. Um, they're related, but they're not the same thing. So, so getting the Lyme requirement tells you really how much Lyme you need to add to kind of get the pH. And the instantaneous pH doesn't really tell you that. So your question about, well, like fertilizer, for example, can affect the pH. So if you just apply fertilizer and then you test the pH, it's going to be, it's going to show maybe artificially a decrease uh, or, or a short-term decrease in pH, um, especially if the fertilizer was high in ammonium. I see. So that is one thing. And then I know there are some of those sensors that purport to test nitrate. Uh, and really, I think what they're testing are just the total um, the total ions uh, in the soil. And then there's some relationship. They're assuming some relationship between the total ionic activity and, and like the nitrate activity. I see. Thank you. Yeah, there's not a probe that's going to tell you how much nitrate you have, but it would tell you, you know, what the ion, like the ionic concentration is. And nit nitrate is just one of the ions that could affect that. Well, it would tell you whether the soil is acid or Yeah, um, like I think, that, yeah, if you have a pH probe and you stick it in, you're going to get an instant, you know, pH test, which is not useless at all. I mean, it tells you, like, yeah, it's probably in our in our part of the world, it's probably going to be acid, you know, unless you've done something to right. unless you've been yeah. putting lime on. Um, it's probably going to be below seven. And and then, you know, if you're trying to shoot for like six, two, six, four, somewhere in there, I think that's what the so the line requirement tries to get you to about six, four. So it says, OK, here's where you are now. Here's how much lime you would have to add to this soil to get to a 6.4. And that is really important, too, because you can have the same pH in a sandy soil and in a clay soil. And you would need to apply much more lime in that clay soil to get to the same pH. So just again, that's where like the instantaneous pH is not that useful. The lime requirement tells you, OK, it, it accounts for those different soil properties. And we'll say in this clay soil, you need to add a lot more lime, even though, you know, your neighbor's got a sandy soil and they've got the same pH as you, but they can get away with a lot less, like, you know, one ton per acre, whereas you might need three tons per acre. And that's because the clay has a much more higher buffering capacity. I see. Yeah, sure. Filters it out. Yeah. So the good I'm news, sorry. Sharon, is that given your landscape, which we know is that, you know, one ton should be sufficient. You know, <laughs> a ton of lime on your landscape would be. I could see that piled on my driveway. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions for Doug. This has been this Doug. This is this is always great. You know, this is incredibly important stuff, right? You know. Other questions Doug, for Doug. Yeah, go ahead. I have a question, Doug. This kind of way back to the beginning. You're talking about starting a composting class. I'm wondering who your audience is. Who you expect for your audience? Yeah, I'm doing this class um, with the Washington Organic Recycling Council, WORC, and they've. This will be like the 22nd year of this class. And it is specifically titled the Compost Facility Operator Training. And this class is targeted at compost facilities. Um, we also get a lot of regulators. Um, it's a fantastic extension activity because there's a law that says if you run a commercial compost facility, somebody in that facility must take this class. So <laughs> anytime you have that written in law. <laughs> or one like it. And there's only one other one like it, um, which is offered by the US Composting Council. Uh, so it's a week long, it's a week long intensive training um, for composting. And we did some survey work last year and the plurality of attendees were actually equipment operators, um, not the majority, but you know, 30% or something. And then we had, I think the next most common were regulators so people that work in the you know the um, work for ecology or they work at county government or um, and they're somehow involved in regulating compost facilities so that's the next most common um, attendee and then we had quite a few we always get quite a few entrepreneurs 
people that are interested in starting facilities. And there's been there's some good examples around the state of people that took the class. And I think, I don't know if you all are familiar with this, but they're calling it, I think, the organic management law. It used to be last year, they were calling it House Bill 1777 or something, but that means nothing to anybody. So this law passed last year, 2022, and it requires that every municipality have some system to deal with organic waste other than landfilling, and that includes food waste. So we're expecting to see, um, you know, a lot more interest in composting at the municipality level. I, I was wondering, actually, my other question was about food waste. I, I get that that didn't come from the fair, but none of your other sources sounded like a food waster. So what are your thoughts on that related to these folks who are coming? Are they going to have those kind of questions? Because that's, I mean, if now they're going to have to start dealing with that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, there are, um, you know, I just teach two of the classes and there's like 25 different units or something. And one of the, and we do a, a day long tour where we go visit other facilities. Um, we definitely see food waste at one of those. Um, this year, we're going to go to a biosolids composting facility. So I'm hoping I'm able to go to that one. Um but yeah, food waste is, uh, I, you know, I think, I know that in the future, not for this class, but for some research, we will be bringing in food waste and, and composting it. And, and we're specifically going to be looking at emissions um, of odors and uh, greenhouse gases from food waste composting. So we will be doing that research next summer. Uh, I don't know why we don't bring it in for the class. I think it's just the, you know, you it is pretty, can be odorous. <laughs> uh, it, yeah, the yard waste we get, they're not, it's not mixed with food waste. So I don't know. Yeah, it, I, you're absolutely right. And, and it is something we talk about um, in the class. Um, we just don't bring it, bring it in as an example. Okay. Other questions for Just, Doug? Yeah, Mike? Hey, Doug, I, I certainly understand as a home gardener, crop rotation is important. I have many raised beds at my place. I'm trying to wrap my head around why tomatoes are such a nutrient pig in the soil and not planting in the same place after year, year after year, but you have to wait. It seems like a, a, a lot longer duration of time before you can plant tomatoes in the same place uh, where the recovery of the soil for nutrients and whatever. Uh, thoughts on the tomato issue? Well, I would say if you're talking um, the nutrient issue, you know, you can always address that with fertilizers. Um, I, I see farmers that grow, you know, most farmers are growing tomatoes in hoop houses. And I see them just like year after year after year in the same place um, because they're, it's not easy to move that, you know, they're, they're not really moving the, the hoop house or the greenhouse. Uh, they're not moving those plastic structures <laughs> very often or if at all. And I've seen them grow tomatoes just, you know, for many years in a row, but so the nutrient element, you could, you could address that with, compost or fertilizer the risk with crop rotation is um well yeah you're i mean there's definitely a nutrient component to take into account with crop rotation uh where you know you could follow like a heavy feeder with um follow like a legume or something like that um but the uh <laughs> hold on a second Sorry about that. Somebody's bringing back some uh, Apple. We made a large donation from our research and they're bringing my Apple boxes back <laughs> there. I got to go get on a forklift. But um, <laughs> but yeah, so in, when you're when you're planning out a rotation, it's a very good idea to think about like, you know, following a legume, for example, with like a heavy feeder, 
you know, bro brassicas are heavy feeders, tomatoes are, are kind of moderate. Um, but the real issue I think is around the real reason to do good crop rotation is around disease. And you don't want to have, you know, the same thing in the same spot because of disease. And so breaking that up with different families is really good. Cover crops are good because there's not very many diseases that, it, that it go after like the grasses, especially. So, you know, that's where cover crops are beneficial. Like you can put a grass into the rotation. You can also grow, you know, a winter wheat or something. And that would break up um, some of those more familiar um, pest cycles, but, but uh any gra grasses are really good for kind of breaking breaking up those cycles. So your your point is it's less in terms of the nutrient deficiencies. It's more in terms of the the pathogens that uh, you know that. Uh, it's that become... both. There's also the weed. There's also the weed element. You know, if you're on big acreage, like a lot of farmers really, you know. So we grew squash this year. You can you can get good weed control from squash. Um, squash will have a canopy closure point, but then there is like it's a very long season crop. So if you have weeds kind of festering under the canopy those are really hard to get out. So you, you know, it can go the, like the next season, you could have high weed pressure if you had seeds that, you know, weeds that went to seed. Um, other things you might be able to keep more clean, like uh, some of the brassicas, it's it'll maybe a little bit easier to keep them clean. And then there are shorter season crops. So you just don't get any weeds that go to seed. So the next year you might have less pressure, right? In whatever it is, you follow that. So it's like fertility, weeds and disease, like you got to kind of try to keep all those into your mind together um, when you're trying to pull together a rotation. But I think the biggest one is probably disease um, being preventative with disease. You know, if you do have a good rotation, you're less likely to, to get disease um, in your, in your soil. And I'm sorry, I published. Doug, you know, thank you so very much for this time here again, for you being available and for you being able to describe all of this complex science in common, you know, in common language, right? So again, this is this is incredibly uh, valuable to us in our mission as we reach out to the public here. Great, keep up the good work. Yeah, I love Master Gardeners. <laughs> hey, right. thanks thank everyone. You know, thank you, Doug. And it, okay. uh, I'm going to go ahead and it, uh, end the meeting here and it uh, remind everybody of our board meeting tonight at 6 p.m. Right, so everyone's welcome to join us at 6 p.m. tonight. Look for the, um, uh, you know, look for the, um, uh, the the URLs are posted in e-news. Okay, and we'll see you this evening.